Newburgh was not always like this. I, I've lived in Newburgh all my life, and it, it was a nice town. It deteriorated over the years, and nobody seemed to notice. There was poverty, there was slums, which most cities have, I imagine. But uh, the people in Newburgh just didn't seem to notice it as it happened. And uh, then Mr. Mitchell came along, and Newburgh was just right for something like him. It was ready and waiting. We challenged the right of a welfare program to contribute to the rise of slums, to the rise of illegitimacy, to the rise of social diseases among children and adults. We challenged the right of moral chiselers and loafers to squat on the relief rolls forever. We challenged the right of freeloaders to make more on relief than when working. We challenged the right of those on the relief to loaf by state and federal edict. And we challenged the right of people to quit jobs at will and go on relief like spoiled children. We challenge the right of a welfare program to contribute to the losses of assessed valuation, to the wreckage of an entire business and residential district, to overcrowding, to fires and fire hazards, to sanitation hazards, to school problems, to emptying the city of responsible, tax-paying citizens and filling it with those who create and contribute to crime and violence. For the past six months, NBC White Paper has been following events in a small American city, Newburgh, New York, situated on the Hudson River about 70 miles north of New York City. On the surface, there is little to indicate that it is significantly different from any other town. However, for almost a year now, Newburgh has been in the public eye, the dramatic focal point of an issue of concern to every community. And among her 30,000 citizens, that one issue has been the dominant theme of much heated conversation. All I heard was bad things. Like, hey, you got a welfare town, you know? Right. Hey, you got a bum town. Well, what are, they doing what are you doing? You're full of welfare right. people? Right. I mean, it's not true. It's, I mean, it's not true. The, the town isn't full of people that are, that are getting welfare. There are a lot of people that were receiving welfare that weren't entitled to it. There's a lot of people who probably feel a lot better than I do. They, go, they don't go to work. They just go up there and, and get well, their you, checks for nothing. Do you know anybody? Yeah, I'm more pro than con. Do you know anybody that's collecting welfare? No, I don't, I don't know anybody that's collecting welfare. No, but I mean, uh, I feel that that they, they need some people need welfare. Some sure, people some need people, the help. Listen, I'm the first guy to help somebody if he needs it. Right. But if someone's going to come to me and say, Mike, give me ten dollars, and the guy's healthy as I am, why should I give money? Go out and You're earn right. It? You're right. I think if this whole thing falls up, Mitchell's proved one point. People are going to think twice before they come to Newburgh. They're going right. to think twice before they well, go to the welfare. All right, now we're agreed. Largely responsible for all this excitement is Newburgh City Manager Joseph McDowell Mitchell, here at a meeting of the City Council. Within a few months after his arrival in 1960, City Manager Mitchell began a vigorous attack on the city's public assistance program as administered under state law. And together with the City Council, came up with a 13-point plan for getting tough with welfare. The ensuing battle within the city and with state officials turned the spotlight of publicity on Newburgh and also on Mr. Mitchell. Today, Newburgh city manager is a national figure, carrying his war against welfare far beyond the tiny boundaries of his city. The Newburgh story has struck a responsive chord nationally. Apparently, there is widespread acceptance of the image Mr. Mitchell portrays of public welfare as an open cash register into which thousands of freeloaders, chiselers, loafers, and transients are free to dip their hands at the taxpayer's expense. We propose now to examine this image of welfare on the scene in the city of Newburgh and also to take a closer look at Mr. Mitchell and his views. Mr. Mitchell's concern about welfare goes beyond the costs involved in its operation, for he sees the welfare program as having a significant relationship to some of the city's fundamental problems, chiefly the problem of slums. Newburgh grew up alongside the Hudson River, blessed with a beautiful location. But as with so many American cities, the older sections were left to deteriorate while newer areas were developed. The result is that almost one quarter of Newburgh is now a slum. This is how city manager Mitchell interprets it. People create slums. And uh, there are no second-class citizens except that they want to be second-class citizens and behave like second-class citizens. And our slums have been created by people. In the past 10 years, we have suffered 
serious economic and social decay, we call it blight, in one section of the city. This is the riverfront section, in the riverfront part of wards one, two, three, and four. The highest incident of welfare caseloads and costs are in the riverfront sections of ward one, two, three, and four, where is also the highest incident of slum conditions which I have described. Welfare has acted as a magnet to those who would immigrate into the city. And welfare is a positive factor in slum growth as it attracts the poor rather than repelling them. Well, who permitted the slum conditions to begin with in the first place? Who permitted people to live in cellars and basements? Who permitted the people to live in stores without windows, without bathrooms? Who permitted all this? City government. Can't blame the people. There are a good many landlords down there who own properties, neglected them, not because they forgot to do things, but because they'd done it purposely. They were just milking properties dry. They went in there for the purpose of exploiting the properties and getting out as much as they possibly could. So consequently, what did we have? We had uh, three, four, and five families sometimes living in anywhere from three, four, and five, six-room apartments. Any time that any the tenants would object to certain conditions within the home. They were told either to fix it up themselves the way they wanted to or get out. They had more people looking to get in than wanted to get out. So consequently, these people were forced to live in not homes, but hovels. I know, I went into some of these places and I saw the filth, the dirt, the rundown conditions. I didn't think that people were allowed to live that way in the, in the United States, let alone Newburgh at all anymore. But they, they are living that way in Newburgh, both Negro and whites. In addition to slum housing, Newburgh has other serious problems. The city's major source of income derives from its retail stores. But business on Newburgh's Broadway is now being threatened by competition from suburban shopping centers. Added to this, an entire business district, the old downtown section on Water Street, is dying. 35 stores are lying vacant in a four-block area. Uh, we have stores galore downtown the Colden Street and Water Street area that are empty. Uh, they don't look like the stores of, of yesteryear. They don't look like the stores that I used to know years back when I used to walk down there and uh, where business was thriving. Stores look good, chock full of goods, all kinds of goods. Today, it's like a dead street. Assessed valuations on Water Street have dropped $1 million in the last three years. And now the remaining merchants are suing the city for an additional reduction of over a million. Another major problem stems from Newburgh's unbalanced pattern of industry. There is a predominance of small factories which provide employment largely for low-skilled and semi-skilled workers. Newburgh's largest source of jobs is in the manufacture of handbags and apparel. These industries employ about 4,000 people and are a basic factor in Newburgh's economy. However, the employees are mostly women. The community badly needs more industries that would provide its men with steady jobs, upgrading their skills and incomes. But the trend has been in the opposite direction. For years, the city has been unsuccessful in attracting desirable new industries to take the place of those which have left or are dwindling. Meanwhile, there is a substantial pool of marginal, unskilled labor competing for the leftovers of employment. And there are those with no work at all. Mr. Mitchell is reassuring. The employment situation is good, and we've found that anyone who really wants work can find it. However, the unemployment rate in Newburgh is high enough for the Department of Labor to have declared the city a surplus labor area. I mean the people that are no, I mean the people that are that are getting the welfare, who are they? Are they just migrant people that are coming up? Are they people that have lived in town a long time, they're in trouble, all of a sudden they need some money? Right, let's find out who are we talking about? <laughs> well right there we're talking about the migrants. If we can stop what's coming in here, which Mitchell is trying to do, right? Yeah. Let's sum this up like we should. He might be stopping some good people. He might be and he might not be. According to statistics, he's not stopping the good Who's going to sit in judgment and say he's not stopping good people? Welfare. How much money are we paying out? How many so many people pulled out as soon as the welfare took an investigation? How come all these people? I don't know. Do you think we should interview him? Enough. enough. The figures are in the paper in case you want to see it. 
Anytime you have a new person, I think we should think that every transit should be interviewed. Every transit, you think that we should do every that? Every without a Before you get a chance. Another topic of discussion among Newburgh citizens arises from the fact that there has been a change in population. As in many cities, growing old without long-range planning, middle and upper-income families have been moving to the suburbs and off the tax rolls. And meanwhile, attracted by employment possibilities for the unskilled and semi-skilled, and by the availability of housing in deteriorated sections, there has been an influx of Negroes into the city part of a nationwide movement from south to north. Of Newburgh's 5,000 Negroes, the great majority, over 90%, are self-supporting, and despite popular opinion in Newburgh, account for less than half of the welfare load. Although originating in the south, most of the new Negro families moving to Newburgh have come from nearby communities and other parts of the state. Only a small proportion come directly from the South. And of these, practically none has applied for welfare benefits on arrival or shortly afterward. In 1960, for example, exactly $205 was spent in Newburgh on relief for newly arrived migrants. And the city was reimbursed this entire amount by the state. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, do you feel that uh, a person ought to be permitted to move freely from one state to another Absolutely. in search of job opportunities. Absolutely. Well, um, all American custom. Well, it certainly is, but your your um, uh, residency restrictions, for example, I think that you required, am I correct, a uh, actual um, job contract for applicants receiving, new applicants receiving relief? Yes, uh, that's nothing different than the U.S. Immigration Service requires. You try and get into this country and see the red tape you'll go through. You have to have a sponsor. But I'm not talking yeah. about coming from another country. But the analogy is the same. Except that we're all Americans here. Right. And uh, it is fine to say that you believe in it, but do you really, if you set up standards that rigid? No, let me put it this way. Uh, migration, uh, uh, improvement, opportunity is the American way. Of course But not is. at the expense of the taxpayer. Well, whose taxpayer should they be at the expense of? I assume that these people leave because they have a problem where they are. Now, if every community adopts the same rule that we will shut our relief doors to you, uh, they will go from north to south and east to west and find no way. Are we solving the problem or just passing it on to someone else? I don't think we're passing it on. That somebody wrote a famous speech about that once called Acres of Diamonds, and your greatest opportunity lies in your own backyard. But anyway... Uh, migration and, and seeking opportunity is good, but that it reflects upon the uh, receiving community is bad. And the uh, people should plan, as we all do, I'm sure, plan our lives and plan carefully and uh, have alternatives. We found that many of the folks that came into our city didn't. They just had no plans. They were just uh, vegetables, in a sense. Newburgh's Board of Education run independently of the city administration, is faced with many of the same problems as Mr. Mitchell. School Superintendent Harold Monson and his assistant Albert Kingsley talk about the effects of a changing population on the school system. Dr. Monson. You can't run or tailor or develop a curriculum beginning at the very first grade or kindergarten for a child who comes from the deep rural south in a matriarchal culture in the same manner that you would develop a curriculum uh, in learning how to read, a very basic reading for a child from your home or mine where we come from a middle, uh, middle income, middle class society. In the first place, a large number of these children in the socioeconomic level have to fend for themselves even when they're home. Both parents frequently are working, uh, if they have two parents available in the home. So the children have to fend for themselves, take care of, their, of the little one, and in many cases have to supplement the family income. They just don't have a change. No use in putting a little league in, in an area, for instance, where the children have to go home and watch the babies. Afterwards, they're not going to be able to play. Uh, no use trying to develop a junior uh, high school basketball team in a given area uh, if all of the potential team members have to go home and carry 
either carry papers or do odd jobs, whatever they're allowed to do within the scope of the law and outside of it sometimes, in order to supply the daily bread. The second factor is this. You have to have time to study to stay up with today's uh, classes at all levels. But these children, where the whole family lives in one room, or at the most two rooms, with the disturbances, the lack of proper facilities to even read a book, simply are deprived of that uh, opportunity. When you run these children through a school system, a good school system, then we find that given the same advantages, given the same basic educational opportunities, given the same motivations and desire to learn, all of these children can and do learn. I think it might be well to illustrate what can be done in a very short time. In our Montgomery Street School area, which until a year ago had an old building with uh, almost complete lack of adequate facilities, we had a high rate of uh, truancy, we had a high rate of non-attendance or absence, we had more than uh, its share of uh, juvenile delinquency problems, a low rate of achievement, a uh, lack of parental interest or uh, very little parental interest. In a year and a half, we put up a new building, formed citizens committees or a lay advisory committee. We now find a completely different attitude on the part of the children and on the part of the parents. The attendance rate now is among the highest in the city. The truancy problem is practically non-existent. The juvenile delinquency rate is not what it was before and we find parents eager and anxious to get into the school. I think that this is uh, inspiring to us and also to the people who are involved in the program. Newburgh school system confronted, like the city administration, with problems of rising costs and population changes, is meeting these in its own way, a way that seems quite different from city manager Mitchell's. We challenge the right of citizens to migrate for the purpose of continu continuing or becoming public charges. We challenge the right of a welfare program to contribute to the rise of slums, to the rise of illegitimacy to the rise of social diseases among children and adults. Now, we've had social diseases in the slum section of our city among 12-year-olds and 76-year-olds. And as our funniest councilman, Bill Doolin, said when he heard the one about 76-year-old, he said, you're never safe. <laughs> but we challenge the right of a welfare program to contribute to the losses of assessed valuation, to the wreckage of an entire business and residential district, to overcrowding, to fires and fire hazards, to sanitation hazards, to school problems, to emptying the city of responsible, tax-paying citizens, and filling it with those who create and contribute to crime and violence. During recent years, Newburgh has made a modest start at solving some of its economic and social problems. A zoning code has been enacted, a belated urban renewal program has just begun, housing inspection has been intensified, all of which is to the good. However, when speaking of the causes of Newburgh's basic problems, Mr. Mitchell seems to find welfare guilty by association. A recent address by a state welfare official puts this question into perspective. Social welfare does not cause unemployment. 
It does not cause lack of education or lack of skill. It does not cause inadequacy of personality or need for medical care or the upward trend in illegitimate births. It certainly does not cause such 20th century phenomena as automation, the longer lifespan, increasing mobility of population, or the exodus from central cities to suburbia. And it does not cause slums. All these factors and more are not caused by welfare. They are the reasons for welfare. The public welfare structure exists to provide the means in a free society to help the victims of these social forces. I apologize for stating the obvious, but it appears that the obvious is being overlooked. The problem was not solved generations ago. Under Franklin Delano Roosevelt's regime as governor of New York State, and as he packaged this thing and took it to Washington, we have had the Freudian philosophy of the irresponsibility and godlessness of man. And by that, I mean that the welfare people consider these people to be not responsible. Their environment is somebody that kicked them in the womb is. We say they are responsible. They've got eyes and ears and a conscience. They are responsible. I say, thank God it's happened here. It's about time something was done about this problem. That doesn't make it hard. Reverend <laughs> Weeks. Uh, in view of the fact that I myself personally am acquainted with at least six of his Newburgh welfare clients, I have looked long and hard for anyone who might offend and who is breaking any kind of a law. Uh, I wondered, sir, if you would be kind enough to publish in the newspapers, uh, perhaps even nationwide, the fact that you have not found any chiselers, because what disturbs me, sir, is an air of suspicion uh, within Orange County. Uh, and I'd just like to uh, wonder if you would well, be able to do this. Pastor, you're getting back to this. We're not looking for chiselers as the average person understands it. As I've said, we're not interested in that small business. We're interested in a more of a philosophical approach to welfare, that it be guided to help the truly needy. And we feel that there are a lot of technically qualified people on the rolls who are not actually truly needy. The truly destitute is in the minority. It's one thing to talk about welfare recipients in the abstract, but it's quite another to go down into the city and meet them in person, something which few citizens of Newburgh have had an opportunity to do. Well, I don't think the average uh, citizen in Newburgh, for one thing, understands it. Uh, they are so concerned about their tax money. I paid taxes when I worked. Now I'm getting some of them back. I could figure it that way, but I don't. I figure that people's being good to me. But uh, they don't understand. They're too worried about their money. They'd have to pay taxes anyhow. I know I did. And I didn't consider that it was going for people that was just taking money for no reason at all. I know uh, from my own experience that there's a lot of people in this world that have a lot of troubles. In fact, I've always had troubles. And there's other people that's had worse. But the average individual, I don't think they stop to think or to wonder what other people are going through. Especially in Newbury, they don't seem to have the compassion that you might find in another city. And I'm intending to hold on to my kids because had it been for me, the kids wouldn't have been here. And so I think it's a problem of mine to keep holding on to my kids the very best I know how. That's just the way I feel about it. And that is what I've been striving to do. I, what the welfare give, gives me and the kids, I take it in every effort and budget to every angle that I can. And they know that for themselves. They can't say I'm a waste for mother because I'm not. I'm not. In every angle that I see that that I can make this money stretch, that's what Janie do. That's exactly what I do, to try to take care and help the kids because I, I want the home to try to be as comfortable and as pleasant as it can be, even if the father is not with them. So I try to be their mother and also their father. Uh, if I wanted a stake, why, I thought nothing of going out and paying a good price for it. In other words, 
uh, I was able to not only make a good living for myself, I was able to make a good living for others who I had hired, plus the fact that I was able to have a very substantial bank account as well. But uh, through sickness, more than uh, anything else, that we just had to lose everything. It's hard. It's harder for a person who has his own business. I'm not making no uh, reference to myself, but a person who's been in business and uh, was able to employ others and then have to turn around and seek charity. Believe me, it was a hard pill to swallow, and I'm not kidding. Well, there is times that I get disgusted with life because I don't go nowhere. I'm home day and night. And it's the only place I go as far as my mother's, and I can't stay there too long because the kids get under her nerves, especially the boys. So I don't go no place, and it's really disgusting. Because I'm only 31, and I don't go nowhere. And uh, Christmas is coming up, and you try to save pennies, which is completely impossible because everything seems to hit at once. So I have two birthdays, Thanksgiving and Christmas, all in a row. And uh, somebody... Well, somebody told me that usually the Salvation Army gives a turkey, so we might have turkey. But otherwise, you couldn't afford it because you just can't stretch the money that far. I say turkey's cheaper this year, but it's not that cheap. And the children naturally want things that the other children want. They'd want to, they used to belong to Boy Scouts, and they can't do that now because the uniforms cost money, and there's no allowance for that either. And there's dues. They give an allowance in school, uh, for school for $1.17 a month for my oldest child. And uh, schools don't furnish everything. You have to buy pads and pens and pencils and everything else. And they have book clubs that the children want to join. They can't do that. They want to go to the movies. And they can't do that. And they say, go out and earn their own money. And according to the welfare rules, if they earn any money, they're supposed to, I'm supposed to report it. For instance, my son John, he wants to go to the show, he'll go out and rake lawns or something, and he'll earn his own money. He's even earned money and gave me a dollar once in a while when I absolutely had to have it, which is against the welfare rules, too. But at 13, he takes on a lot of responsibility that another child wouldn't under other circumstances. Girl, really, you grow up and you go to work, and that's your life. A child is, well, when you're a child, it's the only time you live. And when you're on welfare, they don't live, they exist. While individuals have problems, so, of course, do cities. And it's this aspect of welfare that Mr. Mitchell prefers to stress. Uh, we were spending one million for welfare. That's a third. And that one million was going to support 5% of the population. So we were in an inverse spiral. In other words, we couldn't improve the city. We couldn't afford, like just like a house, we couldn't afford to paint the house. And we had to raise taxes at the same time. Now, the future in welfare indicated that if something were not done, this tax rate would rise indefinitely. The city manager of Newburgh has portrayed his community as one bearing a heavy burden of rising welfare costs. And his concerns suggest certain larger questions. Does the average community spend too much of its resources on welfare? Have costs been rising alarmingly? Does the money go to people who are really in need? Or, as Mr. Mitchell has stated, are the truly destitute in a minority? The answers can be found in Newburgh, for its experience has been typical. I have here a report prepared by the city. Mr. Mitchell has said that in 1961, the city was spending $1 million on welfare. However, of this million dollars, the major part was to be paid back by the state and federal governments leaving the city with a net cost of some $424,000. In the last 10 years, this figure had gone up 16%, not much more than the cost of living during this same period. However, the amount of money in Newburgh devoted to welfare is still substantial. Let's see where it goes. A major welfare category in Newburgh, and one which accounts for half of all assistance costs nationally, is old age assistance. I uh, was a laundress. I did laundry work most of my life, as long as I was able to work. Mm -hmm. And 
What about your family and your husband? And well, my husband was just an ordinary worker, just a laborer. I guess that's the way I should say it. Just a laborer, and he worked until he was unable any further. Then we had to ask for help. How much money do you get a month, and what do you do with it? Well, do you call? well, I pay all my bills. Of course, I pay my rent first and so on down. As I say, I budget my money, then I pay my bills. I never owe a nickel from month to month. I've never had too much money, and I've always had to be careful of it. What is it you see here at this window? I just see people go by and cars go by. And there's the birds and the trees and the flowers and God's sunshine. I'm very happy. Another category provides aid to needy people who are disabled and also to the blind. But I've always been independent and self-report. But since I've been blind, I, I can't see how to work. Or to support myself. And I'm just like a kid when I, when I do something or cook something, I do, I'm telling everybody, look, how am I doing? Because <laughs> I'm so proud to be doing something for myself because I always was waited on myself and went kind of hard with me too when I had to get on the welfare because you feel just like you, I don't know you. You have no pride of, I, I can't explain it, but how you feel, you know, that you've got to be beholden to somebody. By far the largest item in Newburgh's welfare budget is the cost of running the city home and infirmary. The home for destitute old people is clean and well run, but the building is so old it will soon have to be closed down and replaced by a new one or merged with the county home. Next to the city home is the infirmary, also for old, indigent people who are bedridden or need continuing medical attention. Between them, the infirmary and the home account for over a third of Newburgh's welfare dollar. Another substantial item is the child welfare category, which covers the costs of supporting children in foster homes and institutions. All these groups, children taken care of under child welfare, old people, the infirm, the disabled, the blind, all these comprise the great majority of welfare clients. They have not been directly involved in the controversy and have not been singled out by city manager Mitchell as targets of criticism. And yet, as we shall see, they have been among the victims of Newburgh's welfare crusade. With 89% of the Newburgh welfare dollar accounted for, that leaves only 11% left to explain. And yet, it is this relatively small percentage that is at the heart of most of the public outcry against welfare. And you have to go every week, they call you up there for an interview. You go to welfare, you sign up once, you never have to sign up anymore. You keep getting your checks every month. All right, take it easy, my son. I mean, look, I'm against chisels. I don't like chisels of any kind that, you know, that take our money. I mean, it's your money, Mike. It's my money. It's Ronnie's money. It's Eddie's money. It's your money, Bruno. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to see it wasted, do you? I've known a lot of people that have been in worse shape than these people collecting welfare that have gone out and tried their best to do a job and make some money to, to provide for them. Well, then but there's just that. the people that are under, they're not ambitious. They don't care. They figure, well, why should I go to work for a dollar an hour? They I'll it. collect it from welfare. They, so they collect welfare. Don't you think that these fellows that are on collecting welfare, there's a lot of these people that could do some light work uh, and and make this a better city to live in. I'm right. talking about cleaning streets. streets. Right. Oh, I don't, I don't think anybody should take money for doing nothing. It doesn't. Even but it just sometimes it. a person gets put in a position. The image of the able-bodied loafer idling on the welfare rolls is based on the category known as home relief or general assistance. It accounts for about 5% of Newburgh's welfare dollar, although in other communities the percentage is often much higher. In home relief families, the father is unable to provide even minimal support. The average man on home relief has a spotty record of employment for one of several reasons. Chronic illness, lack of any marketable skills, low education or intelligence level, or because of emotional difficulties. A large minority of this group works either part or full time, but cannot earn enough to achieve a minimum standard of living. Other men have been regularly employed, but find themselves out of work and in need. 
These will be on relief for relatively short periods of time. In any event, the percentage of able-bodied men on the welfare rolls is small. Out of approximately 800 people receiving benefits last summer, Mr. Mitchell was able to locate only one able-bodied worker. 75% or 80% of the people on welfare have illegitimate children. I mean, are they just, just statements, right. just right. wide right. statements that, that never mean not. anything? Right. Or are we getting real facts and figures on how many people have illegitimate children? How many people were feeding on welfare that have illegitimate children? Percentage-wise, there are a lot of illegitimate children. Basically, yeah. if you were... How do you feel about supporting illegitimate children? Do you think I they should be left with the mother or do you think they should be put in a foster home? Well, how many legitimate children? Can she support them? Do we have to support them? That's the question that arises. We've got to support them. Well, we're supporting them. You're yeah, getting, I don't feel we should support them. You're getting into a different thing. Well, what do you thing. think you ought to do with the kids? You think you ought to starve them or put them in a foster home? Regardless, it's going to cost us. Do you we think gotta... you ought to starve them or put them in a foster home? I'm I, asking you a question. I feel that we shouldn't have any legitimate children, children to a certain extent. Uh, you can't. You can't of right. all the welfare categories, the most controversial seems to be the one called Aid to Dependent Children, or ADC. Designed primarily to protect children and to hold families together where the father is absent. In Newburgh, aid to dependent children is not a major budgetary problem. It represents only about 6% of the welfare costs paid for by the city. However, it is cause for serious concern. Families on ADC have been the most rapidly growing welfare group in Newburgh and throughout the country. Today, there are almost three and a half million individuals on ADC, and five out of every six are children, victims of a growing national trend toward increased separations, desertions, and illegitimate births, only a small percentage of which become welfare problems. Critics have objected to the high cost of supporting these dependent families, pointing out that allowances sometimes run as high as 70 to $80 a week, more than many working people earn. But when a family consists of eight, nine, or ten people, costs are bound to be substantial, even to maintain a bare subsistence level. A popular notion seems to be that aid to dependent children encourages immorality, that unwed mothers give birth simply to collect extra welfare money. However, the facts have proved that an allowance of less than five dollars a week to support a new child does not provide much of an incentive. While it is easy to recognize some of the problems involved with aid to dependent children, solutions are more difficult. Not work and have babies. Well, who's, whose job is it to stop those people from having illegitimate children? The, no, that's right. This is the church's problem. Oh, no, oh, no. The city cannot it's educate gotta, people morally. Listen, at 25, if you get in trouble once, yeah. You get in trouble twice. Yeah. How many I mean, more like Christ Christ you out, right? Right. How many how many illegitimate children can you have? That's right. I say let's do something with as the many kids as that you are. Well, what would you do? Right. Let's find them a foster home. All let's right. put them where they where they where they grow up to, to be to be out. intelligent. I say take these children that have been unfortunate, that have been uh, not wanted to be brought up into this world like they were, as fortunate as you and I, put them where they can be supported. Take care of them. Knock these sort of off the mothers and fathers that are drinking downstairs in the bars and doing what they're not supposed to be doing and cut their water, right, Eddie? Eddie. And that's the answer. Mr. Mitchell's proposals for dealing with this problem have been simple. To limit aid to all ADC families, regardless of whether there are illegitimate children, to a period of three months. And to deny aid to any mother having a second illegitimate child, with the children to be removed to a foster home. Former Judge Edward O'Neill expresses his view. Stay put. In any event, just remember this, that no city administration is taking children away from parents, except by order of a court of competent jurisdiction. And he's, all the talk that's been put out about that is pure poppycock. Now, I myself have seen cases where families with more than one illegitimate child where no judge on the bench would take those children away from those parents because the children were loved and cared for, and that is the thing which determines the action of any judge who's sitting. Minister Morgan Roberts and some of his congregation. Obviously, nobody is uh, going to favor leaving a child in an environment which is uh, just gone to pieces. No one wants this. But to get back to the economic phase of it, uh, it is totally impractical to think that we could find the foster homes for all of the children, 
that we could afford them, uh, which was another thing indicated uh, that really the cost of foster home care is about five times that of keeping a mother home. I did read where other places are tackling that, seems to me, more vigorously. They, nobody is mad these poor Ill illegitimate kids. We've got to try to help them make good citizens out of them. And some way should be found to find some constructive way for them. Other states are doing it. I do think our program is deficient. As in most communities, Newburgh's Welfare Department has never had any kind of program for rehabilitation. Case workers are underpaid and overworked, and most lack professional training. Their relationship with clients consists mostly of paperwork and of checking on eligibility. Home visits are infrequent, and the average dependent family makes out on its own as best it can. Yet, in those few cities where rehabilitation has been tried, where more has been done rather than less to maintain family morale and to help them become independent, breaking the chain of second-generation welfare families, the results have paid off, not only in human terms, but also in lower welfare costs. She does that when she's sleeping. Ma? The problem areas of welfare point out most clearly that our public assistance policies are at a crossroads, that a change in direction is needed. Critics such as Mr. Mitchell feel that the way is to cut the rolls drastically, to get government out of the welfare business as much as possible. Supporters of a different approach, such as Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare Abraham Ribicoff, argue that more is needed in the way of specialized caseworkers and in vocational and other forms of rehabilitation, with the emphasis on keeping costs down by freeing people from dependency rather than by forcing them off the rolls. However, both sides agree that welfare should not serve, as it largely does today, simply as a funnel for the distribution of money from the taxpayer to the needy. That concept, based on the Depression days of the 30s, is no longer adequate to serve the changed requirements of today. Total cost of welfare. In the spring of last year, the city council of Newburgh gave Mr. Mitchell what he describes as extraordinary powers to take any action in welfare to reduce the costs and stop the influx of parasitic migrants into the city. The result was the so-called 13 points, a group of regulations imposing severe restrictions on welfare eligibility and payments. A court has since found 12 of the 13 points in violation of state law and they have never been applied. However, Mr. Mitchell maintains that he has achieved his objectives anyway. He explains how. Well, we use um, techniques. In other words, first of all, our former commissioner quit. And that was the uh, opening of the door. We got in a commissioner who was not, uh, well, let's say he was in philosophical harmony with us, and he had no welfare background. Strange as it may sound, it worked out very well. And then we screen the uh, department employees for those who would be loyal to our policy. Now, our policy is simply the good of the community as a whole. Um, and uh, we found a young man, uh, and we put him in what we call the intake worker position. You can picture it as an hourglass, and he's at the smallest point. Now, the applicants must filter through him before they're taken care of. So we pin that down. And lastly, we have used a special investigator with FBI training, police training, and uh, no welfare training. Now, these techniques, plus the uh, value of the propaganda or psychological warfare campaign we've been waging, plus many uh, measures the city council has taken, have reduced the roles. According to Mr. Mitchell's calculations, his tactics have led to a small tax savings. Taxes, it was a very small cut, but it was a symbolic cut, and it reversed. There have also been other results. A caseworker in the Newburgh Welfare Department. In the face of being called a number of things, including a bleeding heart, social beatniks, uh, our staff, I feel has been demoralized almost completely. Of course, all of this that we've been talking about has a very detrimental effect, not only on the taxpayer, 
on the caseworker who's trying to work with these people, but it probably has the deepest effect on the client himself. Some of our old age clients, for instance, in spite of our telling them differently, insist upon coming to the office once a month. These old folks do not have the money for taxi fare, and many of them walk many, many blocks because at one time or another they read in the paper that once a month cases must report to the office. This is where the psychological warfare, to my way of feeling, is doing the greatest harm. Last May I uh, had to go down to uh, police headquarters on business and uh, standing there, a long line out into the street were a lot of people, mostly old people, shabby old people. And uh, I asked a policeman what, what they were doing there. And uh, he explained that they had been ordered to come to uh, the police station, that they were welfare uh, clients, and they had to come to the police station to get their check. Well, uh, it was a horrible thing. I was only there for a short time, but most of those people were old, and they were shabby. They were the kind of people who never had much chance in life. Most of them were white. And uh, there was an atmosphere of fear. Now, I think the police didn't care about this job, and they didn't make it any happier, but I also think that they were supposed to get tough, that this is what the city administration, Mr. Mitchell, wanted. The assumption in a lot of this talk is a very un-American assumption. It is the assumption that these people are guilty until they prove themselves innocent. Now, one of our priceless heritages is the fact that in America, we assume people to be innocent until they're proven guilty. They were calling the welfare people on welfare chiselers. Now, does my wife look like a chiseler? Bums. Bums, prostitutes. Does my wife look like, like anything of those? No. I mean, the way the new city manager explained it, it was more or less a crime to be poor. It was difficult enough before, but the scandal that's going on, you seem like some kind of a criminal. If it's what you feel like, you've got a guilt that doesn't even exist. You carry it with you. It's not real. You realize that you're not wrong, that you have to do what you're doing, yet you feel guilty that you're doing it. I think that they ought to stop and think and consider the circumstances. And if there is chiselers, that they should be brought out in the open so that the innocent people don't suffer for it. That they don't have to be humiliated, ashamed, embarrassed. I, I go to pay a bill, I'm ashamed of it. I'm paying it with good money, but it's not my money. And it's been told to me in the press quite a few times, and it's not my money. What they're doing to the little people... And you, they're using the people of Newburgh because they just seem to be going. Well, they we're just ready for something like Mr. Mitchell, I guess. Now, we have no intention of depriving the truly needy of aid and comfort. They shall not be deprived of aid and comfort as long as we're in control of this program. And no bona fide case shall suffer, and none has. Shortly before Christmas, the Catholic Charities of Newburgh referred us to a family whose request for assistance had just been denied by the Welfare Department. The Christmas tree had been donated by a local merchant. This is Tom Wigand. So the landlord came that night, and I didn't have the rent. I told him I ain't got it. Well, he's a good landlord. She says, I'll give you a break, he says. And then? So I... So he came last night, he said, you got the rent? I said, no. He said, geez, I've been giving you a break. It's been going on about two weeks now, you're over. I said, I'll see if I can get it. So I run around and try to do a odd job. I can't find any. I need to work for somebody. Find something now if I can get a job. I mean, I'm, I'm young, yeah, I'm 33. I mean, I'm able to work. I mean, I'm not lazy. I have good bedrooms for work. <laughs> Things is rough. You can't buy a job in this town. You can't buy a job. I go up the unemployment office, but it's all packed. You can't get in there. You get in the line. You gotta wait, wait. Then he say, come back next day and next day and next day. It's every day, but you don't get none. Well, 
Now, I want you to explain exactly what happened when you found out you said you were out of money. Well, the, the truck broke down and uh, I couldn't find anything to do. So, uh, I looked around for it. I couldn't find the work. So, uh, I told my wife to uh, see if she can get in touch with the welfare. I would go out and look for work tomorrow, even if it's 75 cents an hour. So, when I came home that night, my wife said she, that she called up the welfare. Yeah, and I called him up and I told him, you know, if I could, uh, see one of the investigators. So she says, no, she says, I can't even give you an appointment until Monday. That was two, three, almost, oh, almost four days. So I told her I didn't have nothing to eat at all in the house. So when Monday morning come, I went down there by 10, 10 o'clock, like they told me. So I would talk with the man, and I told him how I didn't have nothing to eat. I told him I couldn't even send my daughter to school. So, uh, she says, well, I'm sorry. He says, I can't help you. I said, my husband didn't even know and give me a place then. So this morning, I called, and I asked him how he made out. So he said, our case couldn't be open. I said, well, what are my kids supposed to do? Go hungry? Or she said, tell your husband to get out and get a job. That was this morning what they told me. What was the food situation in the last couple of days? Well, I had five pounds of beans and pork given to me. So we, I would cook them. We'd be eating now three or four days. Kids are getting sick of me. So I tried all around. I can't do anything. I even uh, come home one night and my wife said, how do you make out? I says, didn't find no work. I says, uh, you got any coffee? She says, no. So uh, she probably was going out in no oil. So uh, I got thinking there. So I went over to a father I used to work for him and I told him my situation. So he gave me some food and oil. I had to walk 10 miles to carry that stuff through the snow. Nobody gave me a ride. I had it rough. When I got home, I was tired. My feet were sore and everything. My, my, my kids ate that night. That's how rough it is. Going down. Is that right there? Yeah. <laughs> Your daddy, you girl, huh? Oh, it hurts for me to be in this position at this. It just hurts me to be like this. And kids, I come home nights to keep crying. I'm hungry. I can't do anything. I would go to bed nights and not eat. I can't do anything. I don't want to go out and rob and steal food for the kids. I don't want to do that. Get myself in trouble. Who wants to see your kids cry or hungry and cold? I go out and work 50 cents an hour if I can get a job. The welfare don't want to help you. Shortly after our talk with Mr. Wigand, we looked at the 14-year-old truck with which he occasionally made a few dollars hauling trash. According to the welfare department, this truck was an asset, and Mr. Wigand was therefore ineligible for assistance. Interestingly, less than two weeks after our inquiry, the welfare department reversed its decision. The question remains, how many other Wigands have there been in Newburgh? In an investigation just completed, the New York State Department of Welfare has determined that almost half of all welfare denials in Newburgh during the month of December were unreasonably and unjustly denied. Uh, all right, Mike, you, you care, right? Yeah, but we don't do enough oh, about it. That's Harry. right. I mean, that's right. Right. We got to do something. We don't do anything about it. If you hurt one person, if you hurt one right, person... Right, right. You, you have, have to hurt someone in this situation. No, you don't oh, have to hurt no, anybody. No, no, I disagree with you. You don't Why? have to hurt it. You have to hurt somebody. Why should break this down? Why should you hurt somebody that needs the money? Now, Bruno, I know you as a person, right. you wouldn't want to harm one child, right? I don't care. I don't want to harm anybody. The longer I live, the better I know that there are no simple solutions to complicated problems. Welfare recipients aren't necessarily chiselers or deadbeats or criminals. They're poor. 
They're often ignorant. And in an industrial society, they've had a pretty bad time. But they are human beings. Every course of action you're proposing to take has certain objections to it. There are no simple solutions to complicated problems. There, are, there aren't any simple solutions even to simple problems. But humanity and decency and morality are in the long run the only solutions to these problems or any other kind of problem. And if we have that, we can solve them.